Welcome, everyone. It's the Thursday edition of the Hockey Debates podcast. I'm Bob Duff. I'm always, as always, joined by my co-host, uh, Hall of Fame writer Kevin Allen. And uh, this week, we have another Kevin who works for the Hall of Fame, the Hockey Hall of Fame, that is. Kevin Shea, noted author and, uh, for one thing, an expert on the 1919 Stanley Cup final. And, you know, with the NHL looking like they're going to get back to playing, it seems like appropriate to talk about the 1919 Stanley Cup final, which was played in the midst of the Spanish influenza epidemic and ended tragically with no winner and uh, Joe Hall of Montreal Canadiens dying. Uh, just kind of, you know, give us the Coles Notes version of uh, the 1919 finals, if you will, Kevin. Sure will. First of all, thanks a million for having me on. Really nice to be with you guys. So it was a very, very strange situation 101 years ago. And we have to remember that the Spanish Spanish flu pandemic was raging across the land. In fact, it had, had uh, been in quite strong in eastern U.S. and Canada beforehand and was moving across the country. It had already reached Seattle by the time Montreal Canadiens were heading there that way. So you have to remember the way that it was set up at the time. It was the winners of the National Hockey League, well, the NHL champions, the Montreal Canadiens in this case, played against the Pacific Coast Hockey Association champions, in this case, the Seattle Metropolitans. So Montreal was traveling by train, it was the way to go at the time, across Canada to get to the west coast of Canada and then down to Seattle to play the Stanley Cup final that year. So all was good. They played some exhibition games along the way and, and uh, things were, were looking pretty good, but uh, there started to be some, some illness within the teams, both teams, in fact, both Seattle Metropolitans and with the Montreal Canadiens, but it seemed to really hit the Montreal Canadiens much, much more. More on that in just a second. So the series started in, in uh, later part of March that year, and it was odd because not only was it NHL playing against the PCHA, but it was using NHL rules versus P PCHA rules, depending on who who was playing that particular time. So, for example, what I'm trying to say here is game one was hosted, although it was in Seattle, was was using Seattle Metropolitans as the host team, and they played the PCHA version of hockey, which was a seven-man game. They had a rover as well. The next game, even though it was in Seattle, was considered a Montreal game, and they used the NHL rules, which was a six-man game. No rover at this point. So it was very peculiar that way, but it was the way it was in that particular era. So they continued and, and started off with the series, the very first game, PCHA rules, and Seattle just wipes Montreal out. They won 7 nothing in that particular game. Second game, it's NHL rules. Montreal wins the game. Third game, Seattle rules or PCHA rules. Seattle wins again. It's 7-2. So it's, it's a, a, a volley back and forth as they move into game four at this particular time. And the game goes on and on and on. It's a 0-0 tie at the end of regulation. They played two overtimes. It wasn't sudden death at the time. They played a finite period of time, 10-minute overtimes. They go two periods of overtime, and it's still 0-0, and they don't know what to do at this point. What do they do? Should we flip, flip a coin? Um, do we continue playing? Anyway, they decide to call it a tie, which is unusual for the playoffs at the best of times. Going into game five now, it's a best of five series. So the, the first team with three wins gets the Stanley Cup. So this is the deciding game, April 1st. But by this time, the players are falling like crazy, especially with Montreal. So uh, bad Joe Hall, Louis uh, Berlin Katz, um, can't remember the names off the top, Billy Cotu, different guys were either hospitalized at this point or were in sickbed and not able to play. So it was dire situation here. Seattle was ill, but not the same way. Montreal was just decimated to the point where they considered and asked Frank Patrick, who was the convener of the, of the league at the time, of the PCHA at the time, if they could borrow players from the Victoria Cougars. And uh, it wasn't the Cougars, sorry, from Victoria at the time. And they said, no, you can't do it. They thought they would move forward, but the game was called. Uh, Montreal was going to throw in the towel and say, We'll forfeit. Seattle, you win. Seattle said, no, you know, we, we want to win fair and square. If we didn't play to win, we don't want to take it. So when all was said and done, when you take a look at the Stanley Cup now, it says 1919, Montreal Canadiens, Seattle Metropolitans, series 
not completed. There we are. I had to check my note there. Series not completed. So nobody won the Stanley Cup that year. So that's 101 years ago. A lot of parallels to the pandemic that we're going through right now. Kevin, obviously, we all know what's going on with the pandemic today. We have a lot of information for us to make our decisions. But prior to the players becoming sick, do you think they knew how dangerous it was when they started that series? I don't know if they knew the depth of the illness, but they certainly knew that that uh, this pandemic had raged through the country already and that there were there were certain cities had uh, all kinds of rules. The newspapers were filled with stories and, and ideas as to how to beat it, you know, putting camphor oil, you know, basically mothballs around your neck and that would help, you know, beat this pandemic. And, you know, just whatever they could figure, it, it was a matter of knowing that there was this illness but because nobody was really suffering to that extent, other than what seemed to be a bit of a cold, they didn't know the the depth and, and width and breadth of this particular pandemic and how it would impact on the team and certainly on hockey in general. One of the other traits that it would share with the NHL this year, if they do decide to go ahead, you know, they talk about a hub city. Well, in those days, because you couldn't fly back and forth, the Stanley Cup was held in a hub city in that year it was Seattle. All the games were played, as you mentioned, in Seattle. So the hub city experiment didn't work on that occasion. No, it really didn't. In fact, this was the second wave of, of the Spanish flu at the time that really impacted on the, uh, the 1919 Stanley Cup final. It had actually been worse prior to the turn of the year in, in November and December of 1918. So I think they figured that the worst was over now, we're fine. But in fact, that second wave hit Something that we have to keep in mind, too, is that we're going through this right now. There's very likely to be a second wave coming up some months down the road as well. Was there any lasting impact on, on the league in terms of, uh, you know, because they went through the pandemic and, you know, lost players, uh, you know, having a uh, hall die that, uh, you know, they changed the way they did things? Or did they continue on business as usual after that? It was pretty much business as usual. You're right. Bad Joe Hall did pass away on April 6th, so five days later. And the only other casualty, as it were, was the uh, the owner of the Montreal Canadiens, George Kennedy, who passed away a couple of years later, but from complications from the Spanish flu. There was a lot of illness, but people got over it. Some were detained in, in either Seattle or in Vancouver before they took the train back to Montreal. But uh, it was fairly short term in the scheme of things, but no rules changed or anything like that. And ultimately in the 1920s, uh, the Stanley Cup became the domain of the National Hockey League. So there was no more of that back and forth with the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. One of the things too that, you know, people maybe who aren't as knowledgeable on the way hockey was played in those days is the rosters were basically 10, 11 skaters. So you ba you only came off the ice really when you needed a rest. You pretty much played as much as you could. And there is a theory that that double overtime game you mentioned was kind of the tipping point and the players were just so exhausted after that game that they were more susceptible to the illness. And that's really when they started to fall quite ill after that game. Yeah, it was somewhat deceiving because there were players who were laying on their bench uh, during the game but everybody attributed it to exhaustion from so much hockey at that time. And you're so right, Bob, when you, when you mentioned the size of the team, it was really rather small. You know, you, you're right. You didn't come off until you either were hurt or so exhausted you couldn't. But guys were, you know, the, the idea of a 90-second shift or even a Phil Esposito three-minute shift was so unheard of at the time. You just played until you couldn't play anymore. So, so that was part of it. But guys laying on the bench, was it exhaustion? more likely it was the effects of the Spanish flu starting to kick in at that point. How did the sport evolve to the point where you had two different leagues with two, two different sets of rules? Like, how did they get to that, that point? Well, I mean, the, the hockey was a mixed bag back in the early part of the last century. So there were different leagues at different times. Now, the two leagues that emerged as the, the leaders, as it were, as the most strong teams were the National Hockey League. And on the West Coast, run by the Patrick brothers, Lester Patrick, who ran the Vancouver team, and, and Lester, and sorry, and Frank Patrick, who had the, the uh, Victoria team, they were 
strong leaders. They were well acquainted with the National Hockey League guys, basically from the National Hockey Association guys. But the way that they set it up just to find a, a champion now that hockey was spread from the eastern part of Canada and the United States, although hockey really hadn't infiltrated the U.S. all that much at that point, but was largely because the boys had uh, put in arenas, the Patrick brothers had put in arenas in that area, artificial ice arenas, so they could play hockey year round. So they decided it would be, they moved from the challenge series that had been the, the uh, Stanley Cup at the time to having league against league at that particular time. And so that was NHL versus PCHA. Yeah. You know, there were some precautions taken, as we've seen from archival footage of those days. A lot of people wore masks when they were out in public, and it was encouraged that people should wear masks, as they're trying to do right now. But there was no such thing as social distancing. There was no stay-at-home rule. Like, there, there were crowds, capacity crowds, at these games. So you know, we're not going to see that at the NHL place. So that could make a big difference in uh, whether or not COVID-19 spreads amongst the players in this instance. Well, you're right. Although there was, I don't know how would I would say, it's not, certainly not social distancing, but for example, uh, churches had closed down. You weren't allowed to, to congregate that way uh, in most cities across Canada and some of the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, scouting meetings, just movie theaters had all shut down as well in the eastern part of Canada. Seattle's uh, arena was 2,500 people. So for a Stanley Cup final, it would have been shoehorned in, and I'm sure there were more than 2,500 as well. Even then, it wasn't the 18, 20,000s that we know now. But nevertheless, it was a, a confined area with a great number of people there. And, you know, you, we see how the, uh, the illness, the virus spreads quite readily. It was the same situation there with less information as well. People didn't know much about it. They would see what was in the newspapers, but didn't, didn't have... You know, radio really hadn't come to the fore yet. In fact, it was in its its very immature infancy at the time. Certainly, there was no television and there was no uh, no computers or anything. So the 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 passage of information was was pretty naive, but it was there. But uh, they were doing their best without really a whole lot of knowledge. I'm struck, Kevin, by the fact that you know it's uh, just a century later, uh, almost exactly 101 years, and. Uh, you know, we're in kind of the same situation that they were in. I mean, it's possible that, you know, we may restart again. And if there's a surge and multiple teams contract COVID-19, you know, it all depends on the circumstances, as uh, Bill Daly has told us all. But it's possible we could have another incomplete. Have you given that any thought? Uh, the, oh, that sure. It's been discussed at length, certainly in the NHL side of things, but also at the Hockey Hall of Fame, too, just – what's going to happen? I mean, we just talk about it a great deal is, you know, things like uh, even if there is a Stanley Cup champion, can they can the players take the, the cup around to their communities where people congregate to to see and get their picture taken? Likely not. Um, can the cup travel right now? The cup isn't traveling at all, as you can imagine. Um, what happens if somebody gets sick and then it infiltrates through the team? You're right. It could uh, end things very, very quickly as well. So there's every scenario, every contingency plan being discussed at the NHL level. Uh, I, I have to think that in the uh, the lesser leagues, when I say lesser, I don't mean that, but I meant the the uh, leagues below the National Hockey League and into the uh, the amateur leagues as well, have to be wondering what they're going to do watching the NHL to see if there's a template there at all. But it's uh, very, very possible that it could start and finish not as quickly, but fairly quickly as well, Kevin. Yes. What's curious, too, about that year is every other major hockey competition finished with a champion except the Stanley Cup. And this year, it's quite feasible that the only competition in hockey that will finish with a champion is the Stanley Cup. Yeah, very peculiar times then and now as well. And you're right, that whole synergy between 101 years then and now we know a little bit more, but do we really? It's it's really a, a tough question to answer at this point. Well, I want to thank you for joining us and sharing uh, your knowledge of what certainly is a very topical situation. You know, we we don't know what's going to happen going forward. We still don't know if there is certainly going to be hockey. It seems to be leaning that way now, but you know, we hope for the best, but we also fear the worst. And uh, I guess we'll see where it goes. 
Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Kevin, and uh, all the best. Always enjoy talking to you, Kevin and, and Bob, and and uh, best of luck. And we'll ask you to stay safe and and uh, and well. And we'll talk to you another time. Thanks, Kevin. Well, you do the same. Have a good day. Thank you. But well, that's an interesting topic to me. I mean, I guess when you look at the playoffs, you know, there's always key injuries that happen to players that impact the outcome. But you know, like let's say the Edmonton Oilers, for example, suppose the Connor McDavid comes down with COVID nineteen. I mean, that's gonna dramatically impact their chances of winning the Stanley Cup. But do you just look upon that as the same as if he had tweaked a knee or hurt a shoulder and was out for a couple of weeks? You hear that, Kevin? Uh, I, I did, yeah. We were just talking about how uh, even the loss of one player um, um, you know, could impact the series if it's the uh, right player. But uh, don't you think we're just going to view it more, you know, much like an injury uh, if that well, occurs? That's what I was saying. Like, do we just say it's the same as if he hurt his yeah. shoulder or tore his knee up? You know, it's the same thing. Well, the, the only difference here is is that if you get COVID, um, you know, that's a two week injury. You yeah, know, that's, that's fourteen days um, at a minimum. And you know, if you start to have symptoms and you become overrun by the disease, it could be you know much longer than that. Um, so, you know, it's a, yeah, I mean, that, the, the complications of this, it, you know, when you consider all the, the matrix that had to be formed in order to get to where we are today, where we have a 2014 format, it seems so complex, but we haven't seen anything yet. Like once we start, like it could be a lot worse um, in terms of, you know, anything could happen if uh, one team starts to come down with the virus and then you're, everyone's on pins and needles, is the other team going to get it? And, you know, it's, it's going to be hairy. Uh, There's just no, uh, no doubt about it as we try to navigate our way through, um, you know, normally we would say we've never seen anything like this, but we actually have a hundred years ago. Um, but it's still far different now, M much more at stake here. Um, and, you know, back then, uh, you know, it, it didn't really have the impact that it would have today on, you know, there was no salary cap back there. Um, you know, I doubt whether or not the uh, financial risk was as great as it is today, you know, for ownership and, and so forth. So um, there are some similarities, but uh, I would assume the modern game is far more complicated uh, in terms of what would happen if the series is were unable to crown a champion. And, you know, it, you know, you talk about saying it's the same as a hip or a knee or a shoulder, but the thing is, if you hurt your knee, you don't give everybody else on the team a knee injury, but in this instance, you could give it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 a, that's a real good point. Uh, yeah. The knee injuries are not contagious. Um, so, um, although, although we've seen, uh, uh, you know, back in the 1970s, uh, when teams were going to go into spectrum to play, um, you know, the Flyers flu would sometimes run rampant yeah. uh, in, in some teams. So, um, you know, there's that history as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think there's no question we're going to get started on this. The only question is, is what happens when we get through it. And, you know, today um, I read this morning that a Penguins, um, player, unnamed Penguins player, had tested positive according to the Penguins and had uh, um, moved through, uh, uh, you know, gotten through the disease fine. I, you know, they didn't say whether or not he had severe symptoms or no symptoms or whatever. But, you know, just the fact that we have that player, that identified player, um, you know, kind of shows that we could see that again. Now, you know, we're not playing right now, so he didn't affect anyone else. But what if we had been playing? You know, a year, a month from now, if th that same player, we have no idea who it is. You know, it could be Malkin, could be Crosby, uh, could be a fourth liner, could be a third liner, could be a goalie. Uh, you know, we have no idea. But you know, if if we're a month from now, that one COVID nineteen could be three, four, five, six. You know, or no others. I mean, we just don't know. So, you know, those are the issues and the variables that will make the uh, it more difficult to uh, 
um, you know, sort of move move through all this. But um, I do have a couple of the subjects I, I want to talk about, uh, Bob. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, uh, particularly in the United States, and, and I'm assuming in Canada as well, um, over uh, the athlete's role in the um, societal question of racism um, that's now um, playing out on the streets of America. And obviously, we've already had plenty of athletes weighing in. Um, you know, teams have put out statements. I, I thought it was a, a strong statement from Austin Matthews, you know, uh, discussing the fact that he's a Latino American uh, as well. And uh, I saw Nancy Kopitar, Shea Weber, um, uh, eventually Sidney Crosby put one uh, out as well. And, um, you know, then we had one from Connor McDavid. And that's the one I wanted to bring up because, you know, here's young Connor McDavid, um, who uh, is, uh, you know, really – the most dynamic player in the National Hockey League. You know, I'm not going to say he's the best player because I, I think that all depends on what the criteria is. Um, um, but he's certainly the most dynamic uh, player in the, in the NHL. And uh, everyone, you know, said he should say something, and he did. So he puts out a statement, and then I happen to look below it at the comments, and, and people are all over him about this statement. And uh, – the, you know, some people said, you know, why didn't you put your money where your mouth is? You know, you've earned $32 million. So my question to you, Bob, is what obligation does an athlete have in these situations? You know, I, it's almost there's some hypocrisy here because often, uh, and I know I'm one of the ones who says that, like I always say, I don't even know why an athlete would get involved in social media because mostly all that can happen is bad. I mean, occasionally there are some good things when you can help raise money and everything, but usually you end up with your foot in your mouth or some sort of issue. And here is Austin, or excuse me, here's Conor McDavid trying to, uh, um, you know, do what he thinks is right and it has been pointed out for him. And, you know, he still um, is sort of raked over the coals for it. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough situation, I think. I mean, I feel the same way. I mean, I can relate. I can't. I don't know if it relates or I can understand the frustration that, you know, African Americans are feeling right now. Absolutely. But I can't relate to it. I haven't experienced it. I don't know what that's like from a personal level. I know it's horrible what they've had to go through, but you know, for someone who hasn't experienced, I think it's other than to say, you know, you have my sympathies and my understanding and my support. I don't know you should be saying a whole lot, you know, and saying it's certainly wrong, but, you know, I think you're sometimes not staying in your lane. I don't like that term, but it's not something you've experienced. So it's really hard to kind of, you know, make a profound statement about something you've never experienced. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's complicated times for athletes as well. And, you know, because we had Kaepernick taking a knee in football, uh, um, which, uh, you know, drew both praise and criticism in probably equal doses in the United States. Um, you know, there was the, uh, um, uh, uh, particularly among the African-American athletes, um, there was uh, a lot of support. Um, and then there was uh, a, a lot of uh, criticism uh, as well. Because as, people, some people view that as uh, being anti-U.S. military or, anti-patriotic and even though the, uh, the players who have taken it you know, trying to explain it has nothing to do with the military it's their form of protest to um, discuss about the inequality in terms of the treatment of African Americans by um, United States law enforcement it just people can't as you said can't relate to that and can't see that and you know we just had you know Drew, Ble uh, Drew Brees the quarterback um, uh, you know, really, uh, when D dancing in a minefield, is he he was asked by uh, the media what he thinks now about uh, taking a knee because there's been some discussion that this is going to be back in the fall and and maybe it will be uh, you know it's kind of like the uh, you know the, the the momentum is going to be stronger that we might get more people uh, 
you know, doing. And he just said, you know, I'm just going to have trouble with that. Um, you know, that I just see that as, um, you know, I can't do that. I, I can't uh, um, protest the, the flag and, uh, you know, for the military and all that. And Malcolm Jenkins, his teammate, just took him to task on that and, and basically told him to shut up. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't seem, you seem to be tone deaf about, about this. And you, you clearly don't understand the importance of this and, and how difficult it is for, um, you know, many of your teammates. And Drew Brees has since apologized and sent out another statement. But I, I'm sure, and looking back on it, he, you know, he probably th thinks, boy, I should have said nothing until I sort of figured out, um, you know, the landscape here. And I think that's one of the issues is that I, I'm not sure all the athletes have figured out how big this issue has become, uh, particularly in the United States. Yeah, you know, we always talk about, you know, people living in their bubble, but does any walk of life live in more of a bubble than a professional athlete you know they they don't know what a mortgage payment is they don't know what a car payment is you know they don't know what it's like to struggle to have ends meet you know they can pretty much i remember one time sports illustrated did a story on professional athletes and asked what's the best thing about your job and most of them said if i see something i get it i don't care what the price tag is i mean you know they can't relate to you know you or i or most the vast majority of people are going to say gee i'd like to have that but i can't afford it so it's a completely different viewpoint in the world, what they have to what 99% of the people in the world generally have. So, you know, I, I think you wonder about Breeze. I mean, yeah, he did apologize, but there, there's a team that's a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Did yeah. he just fracture their locker room? Well, for sure. I, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion for that because Malcolm Jenkins isn't the only player now who has gone after him. Um, a couple of his teammates have chimed in as well saying, you know, what are you thinking? You know, you're the quarterback of our team. You're one of our leaders. And, um, uh, you know, you should have known that you would have teammates who would feel strongly about this. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure that if you're the coach and, and, and or the GM uh, there, you're thinking, hmm. I, I sure wish our quarterback had said what he had said. So there's, you know, when you get to training camp, there's going to be some team meetings. I guarantee you that. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I wonder about now that, you know, with the unrest in the U S you know, how does this impact the NHL as they're looking at hub cities? You know, are they going to be leaning more towards Canada now than risking going into a U.S. city where they're, you know, we don't know where this is going to end or how long it's going to last or how much, larger it might grow i mean you, you think you know, we're old enough to remember the vietnam protests and they started out small and people thought they'd go away and they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and i just think that this has the potential to do the same because you know people are angry and on top of that they got nothing else to do because they're not most of them aren't working right now so you know yeah. this is a really unifying you know protest and i don't think it's gonna die out and then when you've got a president who's throwing gasoline on the fire just seems to keep igniting it, making it worse. I don't see the end game here for any time soon. So, I mean, if you're the NHL, does suddenly does Toronto and Vancouver and places like that look like a better option than say, you know, LA or Pittsburgh or Columbus or wherever you're looking at in the U S. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good point, Bob. Um, you know, right now in the United States, we're looking at, uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we have 20% unemployment, uh, which is, you know, depression era numbers. Um, you know, we have a, uh, a situation that um, in terms of a, a true, um, almost a call to arms for the African-American community and many others. Uh, it's really a multiracial movement um, to, uh, to change the the, uh, the culture of the uh, police forces around the country, and on top of that, we have a wild card in the White House. So I, I do agree with you that I, I think if you're now Gary Bettman, uh, the Canadian options look a lot stronger. 
um, to you because you know there there's no protest. So although saying that, I I saw there was a, a rather large protest in London. I mean, it I guess it could spread to to uh, you know some of the bigger Canadian cities at the very least. Well, there have been a few protests in uh, Canadian cities. We one here in Windsor last Sunday, but they've all been generally very peaceful marches of people just you know supporting the cause but you know there hasn't been any kind of rioting or looting or anything where people felt they were in any danger so you know even we're even polite when we protest yeah you guys are such nice people you just you guys just really i after that uh, that craziness and the uh, after the Canucks lost, and I w was caught up in the 93 ride in Montreal trying to get back to my hotel after the Canadians won. So I, I, I think you do know how to riot. Yeah, all our riots have to do with hockey, too. So maybe <laughs> having the Stanley Cup here isn't such a good idea after all. Yeah. Well, as is always the case, we've run out of time before we run out of words. Uh, this has been the Hockey Debates Podcast. We'll be back with you on Monday. I'm Bob Duff. He's Kevin Allen. And you guys, everybody have a great day.